sorry is the first step to sit around the table and say, how do we repair this? It starts by realizing that something needs repair. It starts by realizing that something is broken. Welcome at the fourth edition of the Forum on European Culture, in which we talk, Euro talk about Europe's culture. Should we talk about the culture of democracy, or should we talk about the culture of colonialism and imperialism? Well, in this upcoming one and off hour, we're going to do the second. And my name is Rogaya Sek. I'm a program editor here at the Bali. Let's start by welcoming uh, our guest. Um, today, Mam Fatou Nyang, who's sitting next to me. She's a scholar, a writer, and also a filmmaker and an artist. And she's associate professor of French and Black geographies and the founder and director of Center for Black European Studies and the Atlantic. Um, next to her, Wouter Veerhaert, professor of legal philosophy and head of the Department of Legal Theory and Legal History at the Vrije Universiteit here in Amsterdam. Next to him, there's Kehinde Andrews, UK's first professor and also maybe Europe's only professor on black studies yeah, yeah, yeah. at Birmingham City University and writer of books as The New Age of Empire and Back to Black. And Sophia Lovegrove, independent researcher and heritage professional who's born in the UK, brought up in Portugal and based in the Netherlands and who's currently working at Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands for the Ministry, Ministry of Education, Culture and Science. Welcome, a warm welcome to everyone. Yay. <laughs> uh, this is the program called How Europe Says Sorry. So uh, let's take a look. Je désire réaffirmer mes plus profonds regrets pour ces blessures du passé. We must also acknowledge the wrongs which have shaped our past. Many of those wrongs belong to an earlier age with different and in some ways lesser values. Et dire à chacune et chacun on doit réconcilier ces mémoires, ce sont les mémoires d'une même expérience. Bon, il y a des choses atroces, des barbaries, des crimes contre l'humanité ont été commis. Eeuwenlang is onder Nederlands staatsgezag de menselijke waardigheid met voeten getreden op de meest afschuwelijke manier. Daarvoor bied ik namens de Nederlandse regering excuses aan. We too must find ways, new ways to acknowledge our past. Today, I apologize. Não é apenas pedirmos desculpa. I cannot describe the depths of my personal sorrow at the suffering of so many. Não, é o assumir a responsabilidade para o futuro daquilo que de bom e de mau fizemos no passado. Ave mi tapidi disculpa. Tida mi vani taki pardon. Regret and ap ap apologies. Um, are there uh, legal differences between these words? So, apologies, regret. First of all, it is, of course, a, a performance. So, it, there's a lot of rhetorics going on. There are lots of moral terms used. Um, then, then you have the, the, the regret and, and, and the apology. So, it's somehow, by some lawyers, it's, they say, well, a statement of regret is not taking political or legal responsibility is you show empathy. You are not yet acknowledging your own responsibility. You, you do not take responsibility for this past by showing, mm -hmm. by stating your regret. So what people want, uh, some people want or are asking uh, are formal apologies, meaning that this apology is an acknowledgement or recognition of the wrong of the past. And there, there is always a danger that people are saying, well, 
I acknowledge the wrongness of the past, but only in a moral sense, mm -hmm. not in a legal sense. And you also found so a then, kind of uh, legal disclaimer, I think you called yes, it that that is, yes. in the text of Mark uh, Rutte. Yes, rhetorically it is an almost perfect uh, uh, performance. Uh, he, he got very much credits for this, uh, many credits for this speech. But if you look at it more closely, you see that he is saying, we living in the here and now mm -hmm. are acknowledging uh, slavery as a crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. So staying away from the further, uh, st uh, more serious statement that, what, that it was also a crime ag at the time, Absolutely. a crime against humanity at the time. So according to the mm -hmm. standards of the time. And then you are somehow starting to repair this history and saying what was legal at the time, we not acknowledge it anymore as legal at the time. We, we now understand that it was in fact a legal injustice, a legal crime. And we take responsibility for that legal crime. And we take a responsibility that is not only a moral responsibility, but which is a political legal responsibility. Do you think they do it in person? Uh, um, um it, that's the reason uh, he's framing it like like that. Yes, I think this, that that is what I suppose. I'm not sure, but I think that this is uh, th this speech is well crafted, and mm -hmm. and and all kind of advisors have looked at it and say, well, stay away of this legal recognition, mm -hmm. call it a crime against humanity, but only in the present and not a crime against humanity in the past, still recognize this legality of this past injustice, yeah. which I think is, in terms of an apology, is still ambivalent in a certain way. And mom, what, did, what does those words mean to you? Well, so this reminds me of a conference that we had. I think you were there at MIT, What Does Justice Looks Like? Mm -hmm. um, and at the end, um, there were a question that were asked to some of attendees who had stayed. And the question was, what is the most exciting development on the field of reparation right now in your country? And I was the last one to speak of for France. And people had very int intricate, complex things going on with in environmental justice, the use you know, of law, how all these things should inter intersect with race, etc. And at the time, it was the spring of 2020, the most important issue, for example, in France on the, on the front of race was, is race a, st a thing? <laughs> was still a discussion. Right? And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and the reason I'm, I'm thinking that is that he's going into so many details and I'm like, wow. I don't know if you know this, but my president appeared once to say this. We have to reconcile these memories. Which memory? Which memory? Um, I spoke of Renan of how our history, so most of the uh, French kids graduate from public system, and even if you go to a private system, in order for the diploma in Terminal, which is the last grade of high school to be recognized, a certain number of your course had to be fo follow the street. So history is crafted by the Ministère de l'Education Nationale, the Ministry of National Education, right, old programs. And history follows a, I mean, it has to give pride in us. And when we think about colonization, for example, for the longest time, it was the thing is not to teach it. And in the 90s, I'm part of this generation mm -hmm. where we had this debate, okay, we can teach it. And we remember Jacques Chirac's famous sentence, but then if we have to teach, we'll just teach the good side of it the vaccines, the roads, and historians, one up in arm, you can't tell us what to teach. So mm -hmm. this is where we are right now, from Renan to L'Ecole des Annales, history should not teach what makes French people you know, not feel proud about themselves. I don't know if you know it, but legally, race does not exist in France. The word was removed from our constitution. Race does not exist, so racism does not exist. But how do we get even people to start thinking that this is not my history, it's not a history of black people, mm -hmm. a parallel, but this is a history of France from the end of the 16th century to now. This is where we are in France. And Sophia, I think it's also really interesting in Portugal because the maybe the debate just begin? Yeah, no, I mean, the debate has existed for some time, but in very small circles, mm -hmm. in the public, uh, pub in the media, let's say. Since 2017, it has become very, very big in the, in the public sphere because there were two important, yeah, 
important controversies, let's say, or two things that happened at the same time, which was uh, that the mayor of uh, Lisbon suggested that there should become, uh, that there should be created a museum of the discoveries mm -hmm. in Lisbon mm -hmm. in 20, 2017. <laughs> at the same time, in the same year, um, there was an association called Jazz, uh, Association of Afro Descendants, who managed to get a, um, a project approved in the municipality to create the first memorial to the victims of slavery in Portugal. Portugal has, at this moment, still no monument mm -hmm. to remember slavery and the victims of slavery. So in 2017, these two things happened. At the same time, also, the president of the republic that year, uh, Marcel Rebel de Souza, he traveled to Senegal, to Gorey, the island, um, this very important in the history of slavery. And uh, rather than apologizing or even as telling about the, 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 the history or the responsibility that Portugal has in the slave trade, he um, emphasized that Portugal was the first country to abolish slavery in 1761 which is untrue. <laughs> Portugal abolished then slavery. And also not relevant. Also not relevant. <laughs> Portugal abolished then slavery in Portugal, but to redirect all of the people to Brazil, because that was where the enslaved people weren't necessary for mm -hmm. the plantation economy. Um, but now he's saying... Um, something quite that different. It's, yeah. it, he suggests to apologize, and not only to apologize, uh, but also um, uh, to not turn your back on and the job is done, Don't, oh, not only apologize. Yeah. It's also about responsibility for the future of what we did in the past, and then really important, the good and the bad. Yes, so that, that is interesting. Uh, and it also needs to be contextualized. This was on the 25th of April. That is the annual commemoration of the Carnation Revolution that ended the Portuguese dictatorship of the 20th century and also led to decolonization mm -hmm. of the Portuguese then African colonies. Uh, and the president of Brazil was at the ceremony as well, Lula da Silva, on his first uh, visit to Europe since he's been uh, elected again. Um, and he had just addressed parliament. And this was the speech from the president of Portugal that followed. And he said uh, that decolonization was an important part of the Carnation Revolution of 1974. Um, but we, and therefore, we also need to look at what happened in the past and take full responsibility indeed for the good and the bad, and the bad he referred to slavery. This is the first time that a Portuguese politician um, of quite, well, a president or prime minister has ever even mentioned slavery and something that Portugal needs to address. But it's interesting that he then mentions also the good, which he mm -hmm. refers to the Portuguese language in Brazil and the culture that Portugal brought to Brazil. So it's the sort of a, he's talking about the bad and slavery, but he's also emphasizing again that narrative that the Portuguese brought civilization and culture to other parts of the world. Hmm. And, and just to add in, I think the mm -hmm. context is important too. Someone like yeah. Britain and France, who have this long, huge histories of much larger empires, slavery, descendants of the enslaved living in the country, like myself, millions of people. This makes that, like for Germany, it's a bit, it's different. Their, their link yeah. to slavery is very, very different. It's, it's yeah. much more obscure. For Britain, it's very clear. And there are millions of, of us who live in the country who, if you say sorry, we can then go, <laughs> I'm a descendant of the enslaved. I want my money, right? Mm -hmm. So I think for someone like Britain and France, it's almost impossible for them to do that because it Absolutely. opens up so many Absolutely. potential routes for legal claim. Absolutely. How does colonialism and um, um, enlightenment or um, fraternity yeah, uh, yeah. go hand in hand in France? So uh, how they, they don't. It's not, I mean, the only way, I mean, just think about the way we learn about colonialism. We don't learn about it for a long time. And then when we learn it, it's, it's the, the civilizing mission. We bought these things there. It's not seen as something that was, that is part of us and absolutely not seen. When I say that France is born in blackness, people, I mean, I receive death threats because it's like, no, France was born of the enlightenment and our, our brain, right? And so it's seen as so divorced from France that we can't see it as being us. And when you ask what's the state of asking uh, we are sorry, and, and, and like you say, sorry is the first step to sit around the table and say, how do we repair this? It starts by realizing that something needs repair. It starts by realizing that something is broken. And right now, when I just wrote a book that called, was called Universalism, and you know, people are like, oh, she's attacking universalism. Universalism needs to be protected because it worked and it was created by our founding fathers. Uh, so it needs to be you know, put in a museum and protected from these aggressors who are importing these issues from England and the US. And I say, wait a minute. So when this was crafted in 1789, poor people couldn't vote. 
1789, the revolution. So it was not a democracy, because poor people couldn't vote. Women couldn't vote until 1944. It was not a democracy. Muslims in Algeria could not be, by, by virtue of the Code de l'Indigena, they were considered a second great citizen because they were Muslim. It was not a democracy. And it's because people who were on the fringe of this and people who were, who were you know, who had the full rights but thought that this was not normal took it and made it a better project. That the, We have to not forget that it is an ongoing project and we will make, keep making it better. So, yeah, it's, it's hard actually to... And I'll stop with that, to have French people understand that this is not something that comes from outside to break democracy, to break universalism. It is one of the projects of universalism if we want this democracy to be full. So you're not ready to, the France is not ready to apologize yet? They will ask you apologize from what? Mm. Apologize mm. from what? The bigger problem is if you think about universalism, so what the West is, the West is a universal project, mm -hmm. um, but it's a universally racist project, and white mm -hmm. supremacy is underpinned in the idea of universalism. So, for example, if you think about universal rights, the right to life, what does that mean? What that means is it means <laughs> this is all propped up by colonialism, right? Enlightenment is only a product, is a product of Western colonialism. In 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, Europe was behind everywhere. It would anybody saying that Europeans were, were advanced would have been left off the face of the planet yeah. because Europe was behind. Yeah. There was a then a couple of hundred years of slaughter. We've never the world has never seen genocide in the Americas, slavery, uh, colonialism, which kind of upends this, right? And because of because of this colonial expansion, Europe becomes the richest. Europe becomes the top, and in this process, actually destroys the legacies of knowledge from Africa, from Asia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and. To, even to the point of burning books written in Arabic, rewriting them in Latin and pretending that they were always European, right? So there's actually a very clear project between 1492 and say the Enlightenment, 17th century, 18th century, that creates a world where white people are at the top and white people like Rousseau, Locke, Kant could, could believe that they were superior, right? It's literally impossible. <laughs> with that two, without that 200 years of colonial violence. So that creates this idea that we are better, that white, the white people have the, the rationality, the, the rule of the world, create the laws that we're, still, that we're still using. And so universalism becomes this thing where, yes, we have universalism, but white supremacy is a part, a function, a feature of universalism. And so, when, so for example, when you have liberty, equality, fraternity, you have all men are created equal, but you have slavery, but people saying this yeah. own Africans as slaves, it's because we're not actually fully human. Yeah. And that's embedded into Western universalism. And I'd, I'd say it's still today, right? Absolutely. We like to think we, it's, it's all, but it's not. The world today, if you look at the map by global inequality, the poorest countries are the black countries, the richest countries are the white countries, and there is a hierarchy in between. And we've all kind of accepted that starving African children, it is kind of what happens, right? And we just give a bit of money and feel, feel better about it. So this idea of Western universalism, Western universalism having white at the top and black at the bottom, it's still where we are, it hasn't, hasn't, hasn't shifted. And so when you're then trying to have a conversation about apology, <laughs> about, mm. about rights, about law, mm. and people are saying, well, it wasn't a crime in the 18th century, therefore it's not a crime now, mm -hmm. what, kind of, what kind of a justification could that be? In fact, genocide as a term only comes into being in the Holocaust. So imagine this, before the Holocaust in Europe, Europe has killed I mean, it's, it's the, the numbers are staggering. Just in the Americas, it's probably about 65 million people mm. wiped off the face of the earth mm. because of Europeans. Then you take slavery, you take Congo, where 10 million, half the population was erased um, by the Belgians. Local. None of these counted or led any European philosopher to think, mm, we need a word for, for mass <laughs> killings. <laughs> Didn't, because we weren't human. We're literally yeah. not human it's beings. It's a racial matrix. Mm -hmm. It's a racial matrix. So, you know, we have this thing where I, I, I don't know, and I would very, I'm very curious to hear what's your situation, but in, in, in France, when we think of slavery, our mental image is the plantation of Louisiana. It's not the house mm -hmm. in Guadeloupe. It's um, American cotton. It's never sugar. So the word that we use, our mental image, it's always America. And when you say white supremacy in France, people say, why do we say that? We're not the KKK. I mean, they think of you know, the black people hanging on, on, in the trees in Mississippi, and they don't realize that white supremacy is the code. I mean, in my book, I call it the racial matrix. And race was coded, especially blackness, to explain, to rationalize. I mean, you can't go in front of God. I mean, people will believe in God, 
and say, hey, I'm coming from Earth where I've been you know, subjecting some of your children into slavery. So those children <laughs> have to be non-human. You have to rationalize it um, religiously. You have to rationalize it legally. I mean, if it's illegal to have slaves, you can't just keep people, stole them, and have them work. You can go to jail. You have to rationalize it philosophically. So in order for all these things to make sense, you have to decide, and this is what we did in France with Le Code Noir, the Black Code. Black people, slaves, are furnishers. So this is a picture that is taken in Dunkirk. It's a manifestation called La Nuit des Noirs, the Night of the Blacks. It's, um, it's, going on, it's been going on for 53 years. And every year, 10,000 people run in the city for three weeks, painting black, for three weeks. And um, so in 2018, with some other black citizens, we wrote to the mayor and say that, you know, this is uh, crazy. And the apex of the manifestation is that they have to catch one and dunk him in a bucket called civilization. And it comes out white and they say, civilization, everybody here, civilization. <laughs> so it's 10,000 people. And the mayor of the city, who is uh, um, from the left, actually, came to defend this manifestation along with the entire spectrum. Mm -hmm. And this is what's very interesting Sounds about familiar. France. Very interesting. <laughs> from the left to the right, defending it by saying this. He said that this is the republic because it's liberté. For three weeks, everybody's free to do what they want. It's fraternité because you know people mingle and have fun. And it's égalité because under the suit, we don't know who's rich, who's poor, who's a man, who's a woman. He said, this is the republic. And to me, it's really interesting to see what this means. I mean, when you read this with the fresco, the fact that race can be enacted and all the most racist representation of race, you know, I mean, you have like people working with this kind of um, like monkey walk, the fact that the black person has to be dunked in a bucket called civilization and when he comes out white, everybody yells civilization and there's no racial undertones because remember, Race does not exist in France. It's the Republic. In blogs you wrote, talk about uh, the myth of the good colonizer. Yes, that's, that's I mean, I th I'm assuming that is also something that comes across in all different narratives of colonialism in Europe. But uh, uh, there was this idea of this Brazilian sociologist called Gil Gilberto Freire, and he developed this idea of lusotropicalism. And this was this idea that the Portuguese were more bene benevolent and, and kind colonizers than other European powers. So they were also more uh, uh, predisposed to, to, to mix with other colors and cultures mm -hmm. than other European uh, uh, empires. And this idea was very much appropriated in the 1950s by the, the, the regime of Salazar, the dictatorship, to justify uh, Portuguese, the Portuguese presence in Africa. Like, no, we're not, we, we're, this is not really colonialism, we're just, we're good, we're doing good things there, and therefore we need to maintain these colonies. We're just mingling. We're just mingling, we're kind, <laughs> and we're just mixing. And, 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 and this was at a time after the Second World War where Portugal was being increasingly pressured by international powers to grant independence to the colonies. In what way? To, because, well, after the Second World War, there are a lot of uh, uh, countries that were becoming, uh, they were gaining their independence, and Portugal was keeping hold of Angola, Mozambique, the, the, the Portuguese colonies in Africa, and Guinea-Bissau, uh, Saint-Tomé, and uh, Cape Verde, and using this, this narrative of first the discoveries, we were here for a long time, so we have always been here. On the other hand, we are good colonizers without really using the term colonizer. And is it, this idea is still present? Definitely. Let's uh, talk about reparations, because what's the next step after apologies? And what should reparations look like? I can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> we are not there yet. <laughs> I want to try and be positive. Mm -hmm. um, because I think there is, that once the case for reparations is impenetrable, actually, if you actually think about it, the, you know, we talk about, when we talk about reparations, it's not just that there was a terrible thing done in the past. Mm -hmm. Actually, that terrible thing that was done in the past is still with us today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you cannot mm -hmm. explain, like, let's just take the Caribbean, where actually France, Holland, UK um, have roots there, right? Someone like Jamaica, Deeply poor country, people only there because of slavery. There's no other reason. There's no other reason my family live in Jamaica than slavery. There's no way to explain that poverty without legacies of slavery. And the wealth that Britain generated through our, well, our, our capture there and the poverty that's still there. So this isn't something that's gone. It's something that's very clearly here. And you can actually kind of calculate how much money we're talking about. So the estimate for the Caribbean is anywhere between eight 
and $14 trillion that needs to be repatriated back to those countries so they can, they can close that wealth gap. And there's no real argument against it other than it would cost a lot of money, right? A right way to make a calculation for you is to uh, look at the wealth gap mm. and fix it. Yeah, <laughs> pretty, yeah. How much, money, would it, oh, well, how much money, if we're talking about it's just universalism, if we're talking about universalism and how do we create an equal world, yeah, look at the gap and fix, fill it because that mm -hmm. gap was created by Western imperialism. There's no doubt about it. So I can, as I'm making all these arguments, though, mm -hmm. I can also tell you that it will never happen. Like, mm -hmm. never. It's never, ever, ever, ever in a million years going to happen. When I think of reparations, I think before you can even think about repairing, you also need to just establish some kind of dialogue on an equal footing, which does not exist. <laughs> it still doesn't exist. I mean, if we see how the apologies in the Netherlands took place, a lot of, there was a lot of criticism. It should have not been done on the 19th of December. It should have been the king, not the prime minister, etc. So you see that the dialogue also there did not take place as... Um, should have taken place. Um, and I think, so in first instance, it creating this equal dialogue on equal footing and then seeing what is actually necessary because I think the needs are very different from country to country. And I think there's also a necessity to look at what was actually the impact of colonialism. I think in the Caribbean, it's maybe different from in different African countries or in Brazil. And I think we, this still needs to be openly discussed, researched, I think, because I think there is already data if you look at the climate crisis, it is also linked to colonialism very strongly, but this also needs, and it has been also denounced, um, but I think this needs to be looked into more, more carefully. You should do something legally meaningful, mm -hmm. and you do, do something economically meaningful. And what you see, what's in fact happening, is that they are not giving a legal recognition, but only a moral recognition, and they are not offering economic reparations, but only cultural reparations, mm. monuments, museums, um, anti-racism programs, etc. So that is all valuable, but you must address a wrong in the language of the wrong. So you have to correct the wrong by correcting the law. If the law has been unjust, you have to repair the law. If the economy has caused an enormous inequality. What can be a way to uh, correct the law? Now you have the CARICOM 10-point plan, for example. Mm -hmm. So this is already a plan mm -hmm. from, I think, 2014, mm -hmm. uh, 10 years old, almost. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this was, I think, a very fair proposal. Uh, in fact, so where did this claim from, 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 from the uh, Caribbean nations, I think 14 mm -hmm. so, somehow. Mm -hmm. So most Caribbean nations are uh, behind this claim. And what they say, we do not want, we do not ask for individual reparations, but we ask for meaningful reparations socially, culturally, but also mm -hmm. economically. And, and what they are asking is, for example, the last one, debt cancellation. So there you are not arguing that all the profit has been returned with interest. No, it is, it is much more modest. They are saying, well, there is now a, a, an, in, an actual inequality based on debt. Uh, cancel those debts as a meaningful way to repair things in the present. Uh, that, that can be easily done. But when you do that, it is this, the same as saying it has been a crime against humanity in the time. You make yourself vulnerable. That is a vulnerable, courageous step to take by mm -hmm. Western governments. Uh, uh, but that would be the only meaningful step to do something in terms of reparations that actually makes sense. If you stick a knife nine inches in my back and pull it out three inches, you haven't really repaired anything. Yes. Even if you pull it all the way mm -hmm. out, I've still got a gaping wound in my yes. back, right? It is, it is a better <laughs> so, starting point than, than other... Well, yeah, this is a good... But this is pulling it out three, three inches. So, for yeah. example, the debt... Why, why, why is the Caribbean in debt in the first place? Yes. Mm. Because they were left without, without being able to support themselves because of the legacies of slavery. So debt cancellation yeah. should happen, but it and shouldn't, be in, it shouldn't be in a conversation of reparations. Reparations is how do you solve the, the, the bigger economic position mm. in the first place. The debt is a, like, like a new problem of neocolonialism, which never should have occurred. And I, I, this is what I worry happens in reparations, is that we accept things that aren't actually reparations. I mean, the, the key thing is economic. So even if countries are independent, mm -hmm. they're not really independent because they still heavily rely on their links to Britain. So for example, why is the Commonwealth, Commonwealth is actually growing, so it's adding countries that aren't in, weren't in the British Empire 
And the reason they're joining is so they can get close to countries that were formerly in the British Empire because they think they have better links to Britain. Yeah. It's, it's all about economic. Even though there's no actual benefits to being in the Commonwealth, the big benefit is you feel like you have links to the, super, the superpower because actually since independence, the, the econo economic situation has stayed pretty much exactly the same. Um, and I'm going to give a quick Jamaican example, which has had independence since 62 in theory. But there was uh, Jamaica was making a lot of noise about reparations and apologies for slavery. And in 2015, David Cameron, the pr prime minister, went into Jamaican parliament and basically said, well, get over it. So, look, sorry, don't, they literally said, well, get over it. We're not gonna, it's not going to happen. Um, everybody went mad. Oh, no, and he said, worse than he said, he said all of that. And then he said, well, look, we'll build you a prison. And the reason we'll build you a prison isn't even for Jamaicans. It's because Jamaican prisons are really terrible. And because of the Human Rights Act, it's difficult for Britain to deport Jamaican criminals to Jamaica. So we'll, he was basically offering his reparations to build a prison so that Britain could deport criminals <laughs> into Jamaica. Right there, everybody got really mad at this at the time. But guess what they just finished building this year? The prison. prison. <laughs> the prison got built. But worse, they didn't. But because Bri So they start with the reparations. <laughs> yeah, but it's worse. the story's even worse. Because Jamaica was so, oh, we can't let Britain build the prison, mm -hmm. they actually got a loan from the IMF to build this prison for Britain. So Britain didn't even pay for the prison. Jamaica's got now <gasps> more debt to pay for the prison for, Jama for Britain to deport Jamaican nationals into. And this is not an independent country. And these guys, this is a simple fact. But actually, most of these colonies are still not actually independent. They're still heavily dependent on, on their former empires. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, all my guests and also for you in the audience. Uh, during the talk, I was thinking maybe uh, I, I've made another title, a different title for this, <laughs> this event, because it was called How Europe Says, uh, How Europe Say Sorry. Mm. But I think a better uh, title for the event is uh, A Thousand Things Europe Should Apologize For. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for watching. <laughs>